Hey, it's Nicholas Kemp here on the Online Prosperity Show. And in this episode, I'll be talking about the Japanese concept of Ikigai. Now, welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Online Prosperity Show. And today, I've got none other than the Japanologist, a father, a husband, a researcher, a solopreneur, and the author of Ikigai Kan. Nicholas, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. It's a real joy to, to meet you. We're both in Melbourne, so who knows? Maybe after this, we'll meet and have a coffee or a beer. So I'd love to meet you, Prosper, and thank you for having me on your podcast. Absolutely. It is a small world, and I'm really, really excited about you know your history and what it is that you do. Now, for those that are just tuning in today, watashi wa nimawa prosper desu. I just learned a bit of Japanese while I was talking to <laughs> Nicholas. Um, you know, so so as I was saying, Nicholas is a father, he's a husband, he's a Japanologist, he's a researcher, solopreneur, and he's authored the Ikigan, Ikigai Kan book. All right. So pretty much what he helps people with uh, all educators and psychologists, coaches and consultants is to help them serve their personal uh, communities using the Ikigai concept. Now, this concept has been misunderstood so much in the Western world so um, that, um, you know, it really needs its own definition and people that actually can stand behind it. Now, I could go on and on and try and explain this thing and maybe make a mess of it, but we've got the expert here, Nicholas, who can, um, you know, help us a little bit about that. Now, Nicholas, I've got a question for you. Watashi wa nihonji no tomadashi ga imasu? Now, you see, we now need you to explain all of that <laughs> okay. stuff in all right. real English. Tell us a little um, bit about yourself and how you got involved with Ikigai and your whole Japanese, um, you know, movement. Connection. Okay. I mean, my first trip to Japan was in 1977 when I was five. My father was a physicist and he was sharing his research across the world. And we went to, I remember going to Hawaii and Japan and a few other countries, but Japan definitely left a, a lasting impression. I have this beautiful memory of a Japanese lady. She came to babysit me and my brother as my, my parents had to go out for dinner or something. And I, I think I have this memory of her folding origami. And I have these memories of me and my brother running around the hotel pretending we were ninjas or something. Yeah, so I have this fond memory of Japan. And then I went back 18 years later when I was 23 as a trainee chef. There was a, a company that was going to open a chain of restaurants in Victoria or in Melbourne. And I was studying at William, William Anglis College, which, which you may know being in Melbourne. And they were offering a traineeship to four people. And so, yeah, I thought, oh, this would be amazing. And at, at that time, a lot of tourists, Japanese tourists were coming to Melbourne. So it sort of made sense to apply. And yeah, I was awarded the traineeship. And so I went to Japan in 1995 for a year. And that was amazing. That was just an amazing experience. Lots of growth and learning Japanese and learning all about Japanese culture. And then I came home and I was sort of waiting for this company to establish their business. And they were having all these problems. And then I realized I really didn't want to work in hospitality because of the long hours and the type of work can be stressful. So I thought I really want to go back to Japan because that, that traineeship was wonderful, but I really didn't get a chance to explore the country. So I went back in 1998 to teach English like many people do. And that was when I was first introduced to the word Ikigai very, very casually. So I'd returned to Japan I'd done the teacher training. And then on my first day at this school, I remember being young and ambitious and sort of showing off my Japanese. And on a lunch break, I was speaking to these new co-workers who I just met. And one casually just asked, oh, Nick, what's your ikigai in, in Japanese? And I'm like, oh, ikigai, what's, what's that? And her explanation just kind of blew me away. And I was like, wow, you have one word that encapsulates 
you know, the reason why we live and the reasons why we battle on through life and purpose. And so that, yeah, I have a very vivid memory. I could, I could take you where she told me or where she asked me that question and then explain what the word meant. And then I remember the excitement of going into the school the next day thinking, oh, I've got to talk to this girl about this amazing word. And yeah, she'd been transferred. And I remember the disappointment. I <laughs> think, oh no, because we, we seem to connect really well. And then, yeah, life sort of got in the way. And 20 years later, I started seeing Ikigai in obviously on online and in books as this Venn diagram, which we'll probably talk about. Yeah, another few things, a bit more background. So my wife's Japanese. I, I lived in Japan for 10 years. My son was born there. So I have a Japanese family. Actually, my, my son and wife are over there now on a holiday. So it's a big part of my life. It's greatly influenced um, who I am and, and what I do. Fantastic. I mean, obviously, <laughs> you've mentioned all the people that influenced you to get to understand. It stems from your father, um, you know, being a physicist and traveling throughout the world and things of that nature. And now you have also become a father who is maybe <laughs> showing, you know, their kids, um, you know, the world and things of that nature. Now, while we were talking, I was picking up a lot about your life and who you have become. Um, would you say that this word, Ikigai, has completely changed your life? dramatically changed my life especially in the past four years and it all seemed to be triggered by a, f a few things I, I I'd seen the Venn diagram and this western interpretation and I thought well oh, that's odd and I, I remember seeing the Venn diagram for the first time and so the Venn diagram is this four circle Venn diagram that asks you are you doing something that you love that you're good at that the world needs and that she can be paid for. And then in the center was this word ikigai. And I was thinking, that's very strange. Japanese would never define any word like that. So I kind of passed it off as a Western interpretation. But then I kept on seeing it everywhere. And it, it seemed to be getting popular with TED Talks, best-selling books, lots of blog posts. And I thought, you know, this is this is wrong. Someone should do something about this. <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, I can't because I really don't know what it is. Um, oh, you're about to share it on the screen. Yeah. So I have that warning. <laughs> Not icky guy. And so then I remember about a year after that, I saw it on the World Health Organization website as that Venn diagram. And then I thought, that's it. I'll do something about it. But I really didn't know what it was at the time, other than it it meant something deeper and broader. It was cultural, but perhaps something also universal. So I thought the best thing to do would be to interview Japanese professors or authors or researchers who could speak English. And I, you know, I really love doing podcasts, and I'd done podcasts in the past. So I thought, oh, I'll start a podcast. And so, yeah, from starting that podcast, my life dramatically changed once I began to deeply understand what the concept meant. And, yeah, it's been this sort of chain of events now where my, you know, my whole work life is really focused on sharing what the concept is. Um, I've researching Ikigai sort of become my Ikigai because it is tied to your sense of purpose and it's it's really intrinsic motivation tied in with positive psychology. But there's also this element we could probably define as existential positive or existential psychology or positive psychology where, you know, battling through 
meaningful work or dealing with some sort of um, a challenge or even tragedy helps you discover who you are and you discover this new self or you have a deeper understanding of who you are and you grow as a person. And so through studying Ikigai and researching Ikigai, that's sort of what's happened to me. And it turned into this idea of doing a podcast and maybe doing some sort of information course to now this business where I train people on the concept. And, you know, that that came with a lot of hesitation because I thought is, you know, is this right? And, um, but the more I interviewed professors and researchers and the more, you know, they, they were quite supportive. And I said, look, I've, I've got this opportunity. People are asking me to coach the concept or to coach them on the concept so that they can coach it. Yeah, it sort of uh, serendipitously <laughs> just changed my life. Um, so it really has changed my life. And to the point, you know, I've, I've written a book and that that's something I never thought I would do because I, I struggled with English. I have, even now I have quite a negative association to to English because I was, I'm terrible at spelling. I don't understand grammar. I had to take e extra English in, in high school. But if you have a source of Ikigai, if you really care about something, you'll, you'll find a way. So yeah, it's really impacted my life, especially the last four years. But then in general, Japanese cultures really impacted my life over the last 25 years. I can imagine. And I really appreciate you sharing all of that because so many people go through life aimlessly without actually knowing exactly who they are and what it is that actually makes them tick. Now, would you say that having an understanding of Ikigai is what actually helps, um, you know, with longevity? Because I understand the Japanese are the more the oldest, you know, sort of culture in the world and um, they have a very large life expectancy. This is an interesting aspect because it is romanticized as the reasons why Japanese or in particular Okinawans live so long. Now, I do think if you have a strong sense of Ikigai, that will give you the motivation to live. And so that that opens up some discussion on oh, does that equate to longevity? But as we know, Japanese live long specifically because of, you know, diet. Um, and I guess Okinawans live long because of their diet and lifestyle. But there are actually many other prefectures in Japan that have a high concentration of centenarians. And what's really interesting now is Okinawa is the least healthy prefecture in Japan now because of the introduction of the Western diet. So I think there is some truth to say if you have a strong sense of a purpose or you have this feeling of ikigai, you will want to live, but that doesn't equate to longevity. And when I spoke to my Japanese friends or my Japanese, all these Japanese researchers, none of them ever volunteered information about longevity. They didn't associate that. So again, this is sort of a Western romantic view on the concept. The, the only research I've found that suggests Ikigai can help you is it reduces something called allostatic load, which means essentially it can reduce the wear and tear on your body because Ikigai might encourage you to have healthy lifestyle habits. So you might exercise, you might eat well, and because of that, you, you feel a sense of Ikigai. And then because you feel a sense of Ikigai, that encourages you to have healthy habits. But we can't sort of blindly say it's the reason why Japanese live so long. <laughs> Absolutely. Be nice to, but yeah, we, we just can't say that. Yeah. I, I would also say I'm, I'm surprised how they live that long because there's always earthquakes in Japan, you know, and they actually <laughs> have protocols around that. So, you know, it's one of those things. Now, when we are sort of getting started in business, you know, you are told to either do what you love just so that you never work a day 
in life. And that is one of the proponents of what the Western Ikigai sort of understanding um, of that word, that if you do something that you're in flow with or something that you absolutely love, then, you know, that would contribute to maybe success in business or in health or in life. What, what, what's your comment um, based on that statement alone? I think few people really experience that. I think any business, there's challenge, there's <laughs> there's things we have to deal with, and it's it's not easy running your own business. But I think if you do find something that aligns to your values and you're good at it and you, you somehow generate an income from it, I mean, that's fantastic and, and, and do it. But I, I think we all know yeah, it's it's never that easy, and this is a a Western perspective. I mean, so we should be clear that's not ikigai um, at all. And Japanese will point out quite clearly that you don't get paid for your ikigai. Ikigai is not about generating money. So that that's the only thing they'll sort of strongly point out. As you probably know, Japanese are quite reserved and they don't really seek to disagree or argue any concepts but when i've showed them the venn diagram they'll often will go oh wow that's that's interesting but then sort of say oh but oh no 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 ikigai is not about money um but yeah if you can find a way to generate an income from something that you're good at and you love doing but it, it goes beyond that i think you and i with our businesses we've we've grown we've we've dealt with frustration we've had incredible challenges maybe everything from difficult customers to, to, you know, losing business to making mistakes. And as a result, we, we grow and learn and yeah, that kind of fuels us. Um, so it's, it's not always this idea of bliss and happiness. We need challenges to grow, to find meaning, and then to understand that life is worth living despite, you know, constraints and challenges and roadblocks but we need to do something we truly care about yeah it's got to be something we care about and that in, often involves a social context you know people um, helping people you help people grow their businesses and you're, you're you've got a community to try and give longevity to their their, their businesses um you don't just say hey here's here's your seo here's your website see you later so you really care about the people behind their businesses. And likewise, I care about the people I'm, I'm coaching or sharing this knowledge with. So that social context, I think, is something that's crucial really in our lives, whether it's personal, professional. But in the Venn diagram, there's no mention of relationship or um, the importance of social ties or social affiliation. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, I really appreciate that. Obviously, the, the whole contribution aspect is what you have been trying to put across there, because I believe we're here to leave, we're here to learn and we're here to contribute. Um, you know, you, what you do for others will come back tenfold, especially if you do it without expecting some sort of a return. Now, mm -hmm you did mention that your dad was a physicist and obviously he's into science and finding out um, all to do with experiments and things of that nature, which puts us, um, you know, in line for this question that I have for you. Everything that needs to be invented has been invented. All right. And part of Ikigai is maybe to come up with something that the world needs. Right. If you look at it, there's pretty much everything that we need has 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 come up with what we now just maybe need to do is blend two products together you know like uber app and a taxi all of those things have been uh, created already now does that not spin ikigai on its uh head because it's part of what we are supposed to be doing that we need to create something that the world needs how do we approach a world now that everything that has been created so does ikigai matter anymore that's a long question i know <laughs> It does matter. I, there's there's two answers to this question. So Ikigai for the Japanese is something personal um, and often very humble. Often it's their hobbies. But for many Japanese, it's their coping mechanism. So Japan, it's for many Japanese, it's a, a tough culture to live in. They have 
high expectations in terms of achieving with their education and then in a workplace. And they, they tend to work far harder and longer hours and in a more probably intense or, you know, crowded environment. So their, their personal need for Ikigai is important because it helps them get through life. Um, now, in terms of contributing to the world or having a positive change in the world, there's another word that would better suit this idea, and that is kokorozashi. Now, kokoro means your heart, your mind, and your spirit as one entity. And um, zashi is from the verb um, zasu, which means to point. So it's where your heart points or where your mind is focused on. But it's also rooted in Bushido. So this this idea of the soft heart of a warrior or the, the heart underneath the warrior. So the, the actual kanji of this word has warrior and then heart underneath. And I've actually, I can just quickly show you. So that's the other, that's the other kanji. It's, it's one of my favorite kanji. It's, it's so well balanced and beautiful and has this incredible meaning and what's interesting this kanji is now applied to business in japan so it's not some sort of western idea and one of japan's biggest um business or their biggest business school incorporates this concept when they take on new um, people for their mba program and they encourage their mbas to spend at least three months crafting what they call this personal mission statement. And basically a kokorozashi is the desire to have a positive impact on society using your professional or life skills. And so a good example of this is a university student in Japan who had gone through, you know, bouts of depression himself, realized due to COVID there was this spike or increase in youth suicide, um, particularly women. Uh, women often lose their jobs in any sort of economic downturn in Japan. And there was this increase in domestic violence, all these problems. And it seemed to impact him. And he had this desire to do something about it. And so he created a, a chat, a 24 hour chat support service, which really suited really probably suits the younger generation because they communicate by chat. And he managed to pull together all these volunteers to take these chats. Um, I guess we could call them chat calls or chat calls for help. And now he has over 400 qualified volunteers. They're, they're qualified. They're either psychologists or counsellors. Many of them are Japanese living overseas because most of these uh, chats for help, these calls for help come in between, you know, 10 to 2 a.m. Japanese time when most people would be sleeping. And so his, his goal is to obviously try and eliminate loneliness, depression, and suicide. And so this, this is what a kokorozashi uh, is. It's something that would take you decades to, to achieve or you you might not achieve it, but you still pursue it anyway because because of the the impact you want. So we could think of ikigai as something personal and private helps you. And this is a Japanese perspective. And then kokorozashi is really something like the Western idea of ikigai, but it's it's actually far far bigger because you're basically saying, I'm going to commit 10, 20 years to solve this problem or to help society. So kokorozashi might be what the West are kind of looking for. And as we all know, in the West, we kind of like these ambitious uh, <laughs> ego boosting sort of goals to pursue that are flamboyant. We like to talk about them, but Japanese don't do that sort of thing. They're, they're very humble. Um, they're very subdued in their pursuit of their own goals. You, you often won't know what Japanese are doing because they just don't talk about what they're doing. Um, yeah. So that's, I don't know. I've gone off 
track a bit but <laughs> <laughs> absolutely absolutely i'm a fan of um whiskey and there's a whole new strain of japanese whiskey that's coming up into the marketplace and they never go above board like all the other western um you know uh, mo- uh products to show off or showcase um mm. what it is that they're doing they're just silent but they're doing work that matters and and from that aspect alone you can tell this eka guy in just about everything that they are um you know looking after this so you know we've, we've been talking about a whole blend of cultures um and i'm also just going to probably bring in you know my african concept in all of this because we believe in ubuntu which basically is you know if if you're happy then i'm happy and it just makes the world sort of go around what's your um view on the worst and sort of culture in terms of looking at life you know the way they treat the resources that they have and just who they have become as opposed to how the japanese treat um you know just their own culture and everything else that comes along like we just want to maybe point out maybe two to three cultural differences that if the western would follow through that would actually make their lives uh, profitable and enjoyable or something of that nature great question one thing i, I could say is in japan they take great care to do things properly and so the little things matter in japan and even if you go to like a convenience store you feel that you're being served and they have a whole procedure but they they serve you they're not chatting to their coworkers they're not they're not being lazy on the job so almost everywhere you go in japan everything is either done properly or you always feel served and in australia we we sort of embrace this sort of she'll be right mate or this laid back which which is also something we can appreciate but that that's sort of a, a difference so if i do go to japan i often struggle a little bit when i come back because you know you go to the supermarket you're you're being served and these two people are having a chat they're not even serving you and then they'll say oh it's you know 35 dollars have a nice day and you haven't been served and that's sort of the norm here so it that's a cultural difference um i mean one thing i will say is i feel that japan is for many japanese they've lost their ikigai because like the west you know we now pursue material wealth um, we all seem addicted to social media and so for many i mean and i'm really honest about this many japanese don't have ikigai they have a lot of social problems they have as i mentioned this youth suicide they have another problem called hikikomori which is this social severe social withdrawal and you have men who have spent 10 20 30 years living in their bedroom of their parents house and they don't venture outside they don't participate in society anyway there's all these um YouTube videos and documentaries on it. And the estimate, the conservative conservative estimate is 1 million Japanese men live this way, but it's, it's probably closer to two. And this points to a problem in Japan of getting help. So in Japan, asking for help suggests you're perhaps weak, a lot, lot of association to, uh, to shame. Whereas in Australia, as you know, we, we've got many programs to try and solve our problems, you know, depression, you know, d- beyond blue, um, domestic violence, there are all these, all this money is going in to try and solve our problems. But in Japan, yeah, they, they kind of have to just, you might know the word gumbaru, just do your best. And, 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 or there's another word called gumman, which means to sort of bear the burden. And so, yeah, it's it's not that Japan's right and it's got everything right. That's not the case at all. But they do have this amazing culture where they have these words that represent almost philosophies or psychologies that perhaps they've become disconnected to to some degree. Um, but Japanese also seem to find joy in, in the smaller things. 
you know, I remember eating with friends in Japan and they just seemed to enjoy their meal far more than I was. And, you know, I'd be eating a, a cheesecake thinking, oh, I want a second slice. <laughs> Whereas my friends would be really enjoying that one slice and quite satisfied with it. <laughs> so they're far more present. And this is why they're, they're diligent. And this is why I guess they're, their service industry is so good and they do things properly. They're, they're far more present, um, which I think we both know is something quite powerful to be able to focus. And that's something I'm you know, still struggling with. I think, oh, I've, I've got to slow down to do good work. Mm. Fantastic. Now, Nick, <laughs> I mean, obviously you used to help people with the robotic search engine, uh, which basically is search engine optimization. And now you're helping people with the biological search engine, which is finding their heart, their mind, and their sort of uh, soul. And you've written a book about it. Tell us now, you know, what, what your business uh, looks like and, you know, what people can actually uh, get from the new uh, Nick 2.0 uh, movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for asking. Um, yeah, so the business I do now, actually, I guess in a way I'm a, the coach of coaches or the trainer of coaches. And this whole business was quite serendipitous as well. Once my podcast was getting traction, I had quite a few emails of people saying, hey, do you offer a coaching program on this? Because I'm a coach. I'd, I'd like to incorporate Ikigai into what I do. And the first lady who asked me this was someone in Dubai. And I was like, well, <laughs> what's this lady from Dubai asking me this question? I, I was just kind of perplexed. And I thought, well, you know, there, there wouldn't be a course because it's it's not something they teach like that in Japan it's something they grow up with and but then as I was going along I was realizing you know there's this large body of growing research and these researchers had developed psychometric tools to measure ikigai and there were these Japanese frameworks and so I remember contacting my mentor because I'd, I'd received quite a few emails even one person had typed out do you offer a certified coaching program and i was thinking certified like what's certified and is, is that the same as accreditation and so i contacted my my business mentor and said certification doesn't just mean you you essentially make something up yourself and certify it is it and he's like that's exactly what it is <laughs> and you should do it because you're, you've researched the subject you have interviewed all these professors and uh, researchers. And so then I approached a few of the researchers and said, look, this opportunity's come up, you know, is this okay? Because I, I was quite hesitant thinking, am I profiteering or appropriating the culture? And they were like, no, like the hardest thing for us is often to get our research out there. So if there's a need, um, yeah, fill it. And as you know, in any marketplace, if your audience is telling you what they want, you've struck gold, so to speak. Um, yeah, so now I coach people, educators, psychologists, uh, people transitioning to coaching on this um, concept. And it certainly comes with its challenges because I coach in very small groups, I try to create this intimacy and trust. It's... It's important, I think, that I, I know who I'm training and I know that they'll authentically represent this Japanese cultural concept. So it's not a like a junk food program anyone could take and they get certified. I really take care. And, yeah, it's sort of changed my life. I've met all these amazing people from Dubai, Germany, France, India, the States, people in Australia, people in the UK, um, people in Vietnam. And yeah, if you ask, if you told me four years ago or three years ago, you, you'll be connecting with all these people all over the world. <laughs> I'd say you're joking. There's just no way that would happen. So it's, it's amazing. 
how this all came about. And it really was triggered by COVID. COVID was the kind of the final push where I thought, well, this is an opportunity. I'll, I'll take a gamble and, and, and go with it. And it's, yeah, it's, it's been challenging. Um, and you know what it's like to build your own business and you've, you've got to either do everything yourself and then you build a team out and, um, yeah, a lot of people will have the perception you're, you know, you're crushing it and doing really well when you might be hanging on a thread, you know? So it's, it's never as easy <laughs> as you think it will be, but this kind of goes back to this idea of if it's meaningful and this is something we really should touch on. If it's worthwhile, then it's worth doing. So there's actually another word in Japanese called yarigai. And yaru is the verb to do. And again, gai means value. And so if we compare that to ikigai, ikigai comes from the verb ikiru, which means to live. And then gai is value. So ikigai is about living a meaningful life. But Japanese don't really use ikigai that much in conversation. But yarigai is a word you'd almost hear every day. And so it's really interesting. In Japan, they frame things as either, oh, that's worth doing, or maybe not. Whereas in the West, we might focus on, oh, is that going to be enjoyable? Or will that make me money? And yeah, in Japan, you'd you'd hear these people say, oh, you got to go out in there. Like, oh, that, that's worth doing. If someone's saying I'm, I'm, I'm learning a new sport, I'm taking a new hobby, or I'm, I'm going to um, travel rather than saying, oh, that's fantastic or uh, amazing. Yeah. They'd use this expression, yari ga ga aru, which means, oh, that's, that's worth doing. Um, and there are many other words that have guy attached to it. So there's uh, manabi guy. So manabu means to learn. And so manabi guy would mean something worth learning. Or oshie guy. So oshieru is the verb to teach. So oshie guy is something worth teaching, or it's a student worth investing your time in. And so this from this we can understand, okay, there are all these other words that have guy as a suffix. And so for Japanese, we can understand why ikigai is not a special word. It's kind of a, a word they grow up with. And this got me thinking, Prosper, is there any word in Australian culture that would be like ikigai, where it would be kind of culturally unique, but also perhaps in some ways universal, but then again, very difficult to explain. And then if you asked, you know, 10 Australians, what's what's it mean? You'd have 10 different explanations. And the only word I can think of is mateship. So mateship is something we all understand and probably you understand now because you've been living here. It's important. Um, it's a cultural identity, but we don't talk about it. Yeah. But we do have that expression, you know, good day, mate. How are you going, mate? But we know mateship is beyond. It's not just friendship. It's it's, it's mates helping race. your it's fellow man and woman. It's it's this. I think now it's associated with, you know, multiculture. But it was also tied to our involvement of the First World War uh, and the sacrifice. So this is what's fascinating about Japanese culture. In Australia, we've probably only got one or two words that are like that. But in Japan, they have hundreds of words that kind of represent these ideologies or philosophies or psychologies. And so you could go to Japan and forever be learning <laughs> Absolutely. from these amazing while, words. While you're talking about the word guy, I just thought uh, of my little bit of Japanese, onegai shimasu. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, it's a different guy, but yeah, that's um, that means, you know, when you request assistance or help or you're intending to develop good relationships. Yeah, um, I mean, onigashimas is a good example. That's another untranslatable word. There's no word in English that translates that. And it's very, it's very contextual. But behind it all, it's this understanding of, oh, I might be infringing on you. I'm, I know I'm going to be taking up your time and energy. So 
you say this in acknowledgement, I'll be, I'll be essentially using your time or energy. So I'm letting you know, and I hope that you'll be receptive to that. Absolutely. Whereas, yeah, we won't, we just don't talk like that here. We're just, <laughs> we ask for what we want and um, we're not too polite about it. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. No, Obviously, this is a really big concept. It's a culture in and of itself. It's a whole nother world. It involves the language like you've been trying to depict. It, it involves a way of being. It actually involves completely revolutionizing somebody else's life. Now, um, if my mates here in Australia would like to um, maybe just get started with this um, uh, sort of concept and maybe dip their feet just so they can add yet another uh, layer to their humanity, um, how can you best help them or where can you point them to maybe it's your website or your books or just what will be the first step to sort of work with you, Nicholas? So, yeah, well, thanks for that. To give me a chance to promo my, my book. So get, getting a copy of my book, Ikigai Khan, would would help. And that's that's been a, I mean, it was almost a, a dissertation because I referenced so many authors and researchers and we, we touch on the work of, or I t write about this pioneering researcher, Mirko Kamiya, who really is, I like to think of her as the mother of Ikigai. So I think when we talk about philosophy or psychology or positive psychology, we hear this expression, the fathers or the founding fathers of psychology. But we, yeah, for some reason, women don't get any recognition. But there was this amazing lady in the 1960s who researched Ikigai and she uncovered uh, something called what she termed the seven Ikigai needs. And that includes things like life satisfaction, change and growth, a bright future, uh, resonance, so your social affiliation, freedom and meaning and value and having a sense of purpose. So I bring all that into my book. So it's it's not just my ideas of what a guy is. It's really evidence-based. So if someone's looking for something that's factual, evidence-based and, and tied in with some of my personal stories, they could go and get the book. I also have a podcast like you. So if people go to ikigaitribe.com, they'll see a podcast, or you could just Google the Ikigai podcast. And yeah, you can hear all these insights from uh, researchers and professors to everyday Japanese, all offering their perspectives on Ikigai or on relatable uh, subjects. Absolutely. Now, I mean, Nicholas, we could go on and on. This is a very interesting subject. Um, you know, like the whole learnings of what you've been through, where you're going and things of that nature. Um, we hope to be seeing you in the future, um, especially on Australia's Got Talent, because I hear you become a <laughs> pro at um, Sakuhachi, you know, the Japanese, oh, Japanese right. bamboo flute, <laughs> even though, you know, the family is not excited about yes. that but what else can we expect from you nick in the future oh i don't know um i guess it's really interesting i think i think if you find something you really care about you have this opportunity to grow and yeah like you you've been on tv you've you've been on radio so who knows? But I'm sort of exploring the idea of public speaking and and who knows, there might be a TED Talk or something that I might aspire to do. But I think it's all about connecting with people and sharing this beautiful culture and these cultural aspects. So I'll probably be focused on promoting my book for the last or oh, for the next four months because it took a year to write. So yeah, as you know, um, it's it's not easy to sell something, and you you've you, you've got to approach it with yeah. It's really weird because when you talk constantly talking about your book, you kind of think oh, I'm being narcissistic. But um, yeah, a lot of love and effort went into the book, so I guess I'm focused on that. 
and, and that's why I'm going on podcasts. But for me, ultimately, it's about connecting with people, which I really enjoy. So I've really enjoyed our chat today. And as we live in Melbourne, who knows, we could catch up in person and <laughs> have a meal or something. So that, w- that would be lovely. Absolutely. Now, we, like I said, this has been an absolute pleasure. And I'm <laughs> all about learning so many different cultures and getting to understand how other people can be, do and have a happier existence. And if you have noticed from Nicholas, we've unveiled that not only has Ikigai changed Nicholas life, but it also is a way that offers you pretty much maybe a guide um, you know, to live with either motivation, resilience, especially in times of hardship, you never know what might be around the corner. And it actually opens you up to a path of self-actualization, because if you can uh, be doing, have a happier existence, that actually then creates a perfect world for everyone to live in. Now, Nicholas, arigato. Thank you. For those that are tuning in, that just means thank you in Japanese. Fantastic. I really appreciate your time today, sir. Likewise. Thanks for the opportunity, Prosper. Really appreciate it. You're good.